Hi, Anna Moss here from RelationshipRedFlags.com. You know, women and children aren't the only ones who suffer in violent households. Many people don't realize that cruelty to animals is a big part of abusive relationships. If what I'm going to share with you today were part of more people's working knowledge, there'd be a lot less suffering in the world. If you're not sure about some behaviors you're seeing, here are some questions you can ask yourself that highlight how it begins and what it can lead to. Is your partner asking that you get rid of your animals or change how you live with them? Is he disciplining them in ways that disturb you? Is your partner making fun of your affection for your animals? Does he suggest jokingly or seriously that your consideration of your animals is unnatural? Does he say things like loving an animal means you can't love a person? Are your animals being denied proper exercise, food, shelter, attention? Are they disappearing? Are your animals showing up with unexplained wounds or getting sick? Are they getting timid or defensive? Are your house trained animals having accidents in the house? If any of your answers are yes, this video is for you. I've got some distinctions to share about relationships in which humans and animals get hurt, illustrated by a couple of news stories. I want to introduce you to a measuring tool developed by a forensic psychiatrist that can be helpful in gauging violent behavior. I also want to share a personal example of what can happen to animals in a violent household. Okay, by way of review, abusive relationships always begin with a con, and they're always about control. Now, perpetrators of the worst violence are not just emotionally disturbed, they're brain damaged. These people are called psychopaths, and their hallmark is lack of empathy and lack of conscience. They get off on inflicting pain. They derive gratification from that. And because they don't have a conscience, inflicting pain is not an issue for them. In fact, it's a very effective weapon. One of the ways you can tell the difference between emotional damage and mental damage is escalation. Brain damaged abusers get worse over time. So the violence they commit gets worse over time. This is because it takes more and more to gratify them. So how does animal abuse figure in relationship violence? Here are a few ways. It demonstrates the abuser's physical strength. It provides ongoing evidence of the skewed balance of power in the relationship. It can compel victim compliance implicitly and explicitly. It can traumatize the human victim by her inability to protect the animal victim. I want to quickly say something here about restraining orders. It's important for you to understand that abusers as a class don't respect outside authority. They live by their own rules. Most of them ignore restraining orders and some of them are provoked to violence by them. Now this puts you and your animals at higher risk after exiting an abusive relationship. In other words, the threat is not over just because you get a piece of paper from a court and you've ended the relationship. Many men who've abused their partner's animals have come back after her exit and finished the job. In February of 2010, 
KRQE in Albuquerque reported just such a case. The perpetrator broke the leg of his girlfriend's dog in front of her. They'd been having trouble, but this was her tipping point. She ended the relationship and moved out of his house. Well, he found her new place. He broke in and he killed her dog while she was at work. Remember, the overreaching agenda of abuse is control. Control is often accomplished by intimidation and it's frequently demonstrated by killing or injuring an animal. Another way that abusers dominate their human victim is by making them watch the abuse of an animal. Torturing the family pet is the norm in violent households. The abuser uses the threat and the fact of animal abuse to inflict pain and tighten control over his human victim while de deriving gratification from the suffering of his animal victim at the same time. In January 2011, WTRF in West Virginia reported the story of a spurned boyfriend who kidnapped his girlfriend. He locked her up in his house and in a twisted effort to compel her to stay in the relationship, he procured and tortured to death 29 dogs and puppies. He used his bare hands and power tools and then he forced her to clean up afterwards. This went on for nearly three months until someone saw something and called the police. <clears throat> Forensic psychiatrist and professor, Dr. Michael Stone, has cataloged physical violence for over two decades now. He's developed a diagnostic tool called the scale of evil. It includes 22 classifications. It begins with justifiable homicide for purposes of self-defense and ends with prolonged torture followed by premeditated murder. In between are accidental murders, fits of rage, crimes of ambition and passion, acts of revenge and sabotage. Many of his classifications include psychopathic qualities, such as grandiosity, glibness, superficial charm, pathological lying, relentlessness, deceit, manipulativeness, callousness, and lack of remorse. Dr. Stone's work has been made into a television show called Most Evil. And you can see it on the Discovery Channel. In each episode, he describes various crimes. He deconstructs the criminal mind that committed them and then extracts the lesson for society from each one of them. Another very valuable diagnostic tool is Dr. Robert Hari's psychopathic checklist. It's now in wide use in the prison system, and I wish it was taught in high schools and college. In the course of my own experience with an abusive husband, I got separated from most of my animals, some permanently, some temporarily. Shortly before we left my farm in the country for his home in the suburbs in another state, my husband told me that he didn't want me to bring my favorite cat, Joey. This was out of the blue and this was a terrible blow to me because at the time, I didn't know how abusive relationships worked. What I eventually figured out was that even though my husband had presented himself as animal friendly, he wasn't. In fact, he was indifferent to animals in general, and he was resentful of mine in particular. And for some reason, he was especially jealous of this little cat, Joey. He threatened to throw this cat out of the truck once we were underway if I didn't leave him behind to be picked up with some of the other cats by their new owners. I failed to find a way to bring Joy with me and I never saw him again. 
there's a growing body of evidence that confirms what I'm telling you about. One of the first big studies was actually done at Yale in the 1980s. Researchers interviewed almost a thousand death row inmates and what they found was that these men had all tortured animals. They'd started with insects, amphibians, or reptiles, moved to small animals, then larger animals, and then human victims. This progression of abuse from insect to human was in the background of every single death row inmate they interviewed, everyone. Now in a much smaller, more recent study, it was found that horse abuse is a frequent precursor to rape. Bestiality and dog fighting are two very dark and disturbing aspects of animal abuse with links to other violent crimes, including domestic abuse. The Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the SPCA, was originally founded over 100 years ago as the Society for the Protection of Animals and Children. Its original purpose is still valid today, and that is to protect the innocent and teach compassion. The extent of animal abuse in violent households is well over 70%. And those who are on the front lines of this will tell you that animal cruelty, like a lot of other crimes, is greatly underreported. Animals are easy targets. They can be easily overpowered. They don't have spoken language. They can't identify their abuser. And when the signs of their abuse become evident, they can be hidden from view or destroyed. Personally, I believe the very sickest of the sick direct their violent depredations towards animals and children for these reasons. The significance of the overlap of domestic violence and animal cruelty can't be overemphasized. Proclaiming the fact that the great majority of animal torture occurs at the hands of individuals who are also torturing women and children needs to be done until it is no longer, and maybe then some. Gandhi was right when he said that the way a country treats its animals testifies to its true morality and determines the tenor of its future. You'll find more information at relationshipredflags.com. Thanks for watching.